Dr. Bailey is a professor of psychology at Northwestern University and highly regarded for his work on the etiology of sexual orientation, gender nonconformity, the genetics of sexual orientation, and the sexual arousal response. He's the author of the well-known book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, The Science of Gender Bending and Transsexualism, which was published in 2003. And his work has received widespread attention in the media, including the Boston Globe, Washington Post, CB CBS News, just to name a few. So I now turn to our experts in emotion interview with Dr. Michael Bailey. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you about um, as we start off our conversation today is, what got you interested in studying emotion and sex? Sort of where did it all begin in the first place? Well, uh, I was a clinical psychology graduate student at the University of Texas, and I was taking a uh, graduate uh, sex course. And it became clear to me uh, how much interesting questions, how, many, how much interesting work there was to be done uh, in that domain. Uh, you know, let's be honest, uh, everybody finds sex to be a pretty interesting topic, but for various reasons, people tend to avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed uh, like a niche uh, that, and you know, I'm really glad that I went there because I've uh, been able to do some interesting things. Fantastic. And so some of the interesting things you've been doing are exactly where I'd like to kind of start off our questions today about your work because it's something like you're saying that appeals to almost everyone, yet um, really I think until you pioneered work in this area we knew almost nothing, especially when we related it to things like sexual arousal and emotion. Um, so what I'd love to ask you a bit about, so in this realm, I mean, you're really widely known for demonstrating distinct patterns of sexual arousal response between men and women and um, men and women of differing kind of sexual orientations. So I wonder if you might say a little bit about what you saw as some of the most exciting discoveries when you first embarked in this line of research. Sure. So um, we've known for a while that men um, there's a close, it, that, okay, start over. Uh, we've known for a while that in men, uh, there is a close correspondence between their sexual orientation and their pattern of sexual arousal in the laboratory. That is, for example, uh, homosexual men uh, will get uh, erections to stimulate depicting men, uh, but not so much to stimulate depicting women. Uh, heterosexual men show the opposite pattern. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, for men, uh, sexual orientation is a pattern of sexual arousal. That's how we know what our sexual orientation is. Um, we really haven't known much about women for a while, uh, in part because how to measure sexual arousal in women uh, was less clear um, in men, you can measure uh, the degree of erection. You know, that's a pretty uh, obvious way to do it. In women, what do you measure? Well, uh, people have constructed an instrument that seems to work pretty well. Uh, it measures uh, blood flow in the vagina. And in both men and women, uh, genital arousal depends upon the flow of blood in the genitals. Um, so anyway, uh, we were interested in whether in women as well, uh, sexual orientation corresponds with a pattern of sexual arousal. Uh, and so we did the analogous study. And by the way, in our studies, we show videos uh, of couples having uh, pretty graphic sex. Uh, and the uh, most interesting kinds of couples are same-sex couples, that is either two men or two women. Uh, people who like women should uh, respond to the stimuli with two women. People who like men should uh, respond to the stimuli depicting men. So we did this study with uh, both heterosexual and homosexual women, and we found uh, that heterosexual women uh, really respond uh, to both equally, uh, very different than either heterosexual or homosexual women, uh, men uh, who show uh, a strong bias for their preferred sex. 
if you will, uh, heterosexual women show a bisexual arousal pattern in the lab. That's not to say that they are bisexual. It's just to say that their sexual arousal patterns, their genital sexual arousal patterns, provide no information uh, regarding their sexual uh, preference for sex with men or sex with women. Um, lesbians uh, showed a somewhat biased arousal pattern. They got slightly more sexually aroused uh, to uh, female stimuli than to male stimuli, uh, but it was not nearly as strong a bias as men show. So what do you think this tells us about, you know, you've spoken a bit about this already, but to the relative influence of, you know, gender on the one hand and sexual orientation on the other and really kind of predicting our degree of sexual arousal? Well, I, I think that the clearest thing it shows is, is that men and women do sexual orientation differently. Uh, and uh, men, I think we understand pretty well. Uh, and I'll just repeat, I think that for men, sexual orientation is precisely a pattern of sexual arousal. It's their emotional response to uh, attractive men versus attractive women. That's not what sexual orientation is for women. In fact, I think that we barely understand sexual orientation in women. There's a lot of work to do, but it's not about sexual arousal at least as far as we can tell. So it's really interesting, and I mean, you've really, you know, pioneered other research related to sexual orientation that I want to ask you a bit more about as well. I mean, one of the lines in particular is on gender nonconformity, and you note that your work seems to really interestingly support some of the common stereotypes that we may have for gay men and lesbian women, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about these findings. Well, okay. Um, First of all, we've known for quite a long time that uh, childhood gender nonconformity is associated with adult homosexuality. That is, uh, boys who are uh, relatively feminine have a better chance than boys who are typical uh, in their gender role behavior uh, to become gay men. And uh, an analogous uh, uh, relation holds for uh, women. Um, we know this both on retrospective studies and prospective studies. Uh, and there are clearly stereotypes about the way that, uh, for example, gay men uh, move and speak and what their interests are and so on. And there are uh, also stereotypes about lesbians. Uh, are these stereotypes true? Well, it was uh, very fashionable in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s uh, to say, well, of course not. There are no differences between heterosexual and homosexual people except who they want to have sex with. Um, but we have started uh, to study these uh, phenomena in the lab. Uh, we've actually gotten pretty far. And there's no longer any doubt that on average, the stereotypes are true. Uh, we, if we videotape uh, homosexual and heterosexual men, for example, people are much better than chance at uh, telling who's who, even though the men don't mention their sexuality at all. Uh, now, I, I should emphasize that uh, people aren't perfect at it. Uh, these phenomena are true on average, which is the only way that stereotypes are ever true. Um, and I'll also say that... Um, there's nothing wrong with these stereotypes, in my opinion, that uh, gay men are somewhat feminine does not mean to me that they're inferior in any way. Uh, I think many straight men could uh, stand to be a bit more feminine. Uh, stereotypes in the gender realm tend to be uh, true on average, and this is one of them. And so it's interesting, too. I mean, you've also looked at how behavioral genetics, right, can also inform our understanding of sexual orientation. And I wonder, you know, to what extent your work and work of others you've read does suggest that sexual orientation can be influenced to some degree by genetic factors. The genetics of sexual orientation is uh, something that I've been interested in uh, ever since I entered sex research. It's uh, one of the things I studied in my dissertation, and I've done several twin studies of uh, sexual orientation. 
My views on what the data say have evolved somewhat. Uh, the early studies uh, seem to show a very strong uh, influence of genes on sexual orientation. Uh, those studies, however, um, were not the best studies in terms of um, the way that uh, participants were sampled. Uh, since I did most of those studies, I can criticize them. I suppose. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as uh, sampling has gotten better uh, with the use of twin registries and so on, uh, the uh, concordance rates, that is the degree of similarity between uh, twins of the same pair, have shrunken. Uh, and uh, estimates of genetic causation have shrunken somewhat, too. Uh, I would say that it still looks like genes play a role, but uh, less of a role than for um, most other traits that have been studied. Uh, that makes sense to me, uh, given the evolutionary paradox of how genes for homosexuality uh, might persist. You know, uh, homosexual people... Uh, uh, seem not to be as interested in mating with the opposite sex and reproducing uh, as heterosexual people. And so we would expect genes for homosexuality to uh, uh, be disadvantaged evolutionarily. And uh, I think that the uh, genetic data, the best genetic data, are consistent with that. So, I mean, finally, this has been really interesting talking to you about your work on, you know, sexual arousal, sexual orientation, and even the role potentially of, you know, behavioral genetics in helping us understand to what extent genes play a role in these kinds of sexual, you know, preferences and behaviors. And so I think one thing that's really important in all of this is that, you know, your work has used these really precise methodological tools to study, you know, as you said at the outset, this is one of the most fundamental domains of what makes us human and it's such a central part of, you know, motivational systems. At the same time, it's been largely taboo for, for various reasons. And so I think part of what's great to talk with you is also to hear about your expertise and sort of what you see as the most innovative tools or stimuli or ways that researchers can try to study, you know, sex and sexual arousal better given that it is a domain that seems not to be as largely tapped into as others. So I just wonder if you might say a little bit more about this for people who are less familiar with this kind of work. Well, I, I do think that um, studying sexual arousal uh, is very important uh, for people who want to study uh, sexual orientation. Uh, in part, uh, you know, otherwise we're uh, reliant on people's self-reports, and uh, that can be misleading, uh, particularly uh, when some sexual orientations are stigmatized as homosexuality has been, although it is decreasingly stigmatized, obviously. Uh, so, and, and also people don't always have perfect insight into what their uh, sexual feelings are. Uh, so I do think it is important to try to use objective measures, and uh, genital sexual arousal is an objective measure. Uh, it does have some problems in that um, people don't always, men especially, don't always respond enough to give a good signal. Uh, one innovation that we've been trying is to uh, move the action upstairs to studying the brain uh, using brain imaging, uh, fMRI. Uh, we've done uh, a fairly large study by fMRI standards on men, and we're completing one on women. And uh, my preliminary results, I would say, are that, uh, well, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, I would have thought that fMRI would have had an advantage uh, over genital measures because um, you know, sexual feelings start in the brain. And, uh, you know, one can have the feeling of sexual arousal without an obvious genital response. Uh, nevertheless, I, I, I think that um, our results suggest that uh, brain imaging, as it stands today in 2012, is not as sensitive a measure as the genital measures. So what do you see then as some of the biggest challenges in conducting this kind of work? 
Well, I, I think uh, the biggest challenge remains uh, people's squeamishness uh, regarding matters of sex, and that um, starts with, for example, uh, potential participants. It also affects IRBs, institutional review boards, and their scrutiny that they give uh, research, and uh, perhaps most importantly, funding agencies uh, and uh, people who hire for jobs at universities uh, are all hesitant to uh, favor sex research, or they, they're all prejudiced against sex research, actually. So uh, I think that you know, we need to work on having people accept that sexuality is an important uh, part of human life and is deserving of attention as any other emotion. So then as you think about the future of you know, research and emotion and how it can try to include measures of sexual arousal and sexuality more broadly, where might you see the future of the field headed in a way that can begin to really, you know, accept, you know, and expand this line of work on, like you're saying, an important part of what makes us human, an important part of everyday life? Well, I, I think that, um, I think that one direction will depend upon uh, breakthroughs in the field, which is simply, uh, you know, the instruments to measure sexual arousal. We have to keep trying to develop better instruments things that are less uh, intrusive, uh, you know, for example, uh, genital measures, you know, have to go on the genitals in, in the lab and, and people are uh, uh, hesitant to do that. So we need to develop uh, better instruments or at least less invasive instruments. Uh, and we just need to keep uh, educating people about our findings, uh, and hopefully uh, they'll be interested enough in the findings uh, to want more. So finally, I want to ask, you know, related to the future of the field, a big part of this are the next generation of students that are going to be pushing this kind of research forward. So when students come to you and they're interested in sort of embarking in the study of sexual arousal or sexual orientation, what kind of advice do you usually give them or, or would you give them? Well, I, I, I would say it's a fine thing to be interested in. It's important to uh, be aware of the uh, barriers in this uh, field of research, uh, the attitudes that people have, uh, the, the fact that uh, funding is hard to get, that jobs are relatively few, uh, and try to change that if you can. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you. And with that, this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Michael Bailey from Northwestern University.